outside of it because I'm thinking it. You have to be in it to be unity, and nobody can think of it. It's like a fish trying to imagine the water in which it swims. You just can't see it. It's part of you already. So uh, that unity consciousness, because it's so unthinkable, is nevertheless the fundamental ground of being out of which everything arises. And this is evident to me, not only from spirituality, but it's also evident to me from the uh, quantum physical understanding of how the universe comes into being. It can't just come into being through mechanical means. We've tried, believe me, physicists are looking for all the, all the mechanical ways they could possibly seek to find a mechanical means by which <clears throat> God could be left out of the equation. <laughs> And we haven't been able to do it. Somewhere along the line, something, a, a miracle has to happen. And, 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 and it's disturbing because science doesn't want miracles. Science wants to have everything explained in terms of objective fact. There is, not, there is something unobjective or subjective about the nature of reality. Now, I'm not the only one that knows this or brings this up or, or, or thinks about it. Uh, a number of, of great minds, and I don't consider myself to be a great mind, but a number of great minds have seen this or realized it. One of my favorites to talk about is a, a physicist whose name is Wolfgang Pauli. Now, Pauli was an Austrian-German physicist, uh, born around 1900, died at the age of 59. Very young man. Uh, very brilliant, and a, almost like a number mystic, although he would never say that about himself. He was, very, he was rigid in a certain sense, but very imaginative. By the time he reached his 40s, he realized that something was missing, missing in his life, and he began to have these dreams. They were very mystical, magical dreams, and they're, they're wonderful stories. I, I, it would take me more time than we have to go into them. But in these, he realized that what was missing was the spiritual understanding. He realized that something other than the physical was necessary in order to even have a physical. So this is Wolfgang Pauli, who's a Nobel Prize in theoretical physics. Einstein even speaks about God, maybe loosely, but nevertheless, the more you deep, the deeper you go into this, the more you begin to uncover that there's got to be something that I don't see in, my, I don't see in the equations. And in quantum physics, this became extremely evident and very disturbing to all the quantum physicists when they first discovered it, is that somehow observation, looking at something, the means by which you go about looking at something, actually affects the thing being looked at. Now, some people think it means looking at something makes a force that pushes it or pulls it or something. No. No, because what we're dealing with at this level in quantum physics is not me, an observer, looking at it, a thing. It's something called an observer, which I have no idea even what it is, interacting with something which is not a thing yet. It ha it's, a, it's, an, it's not a no thing, but it's not a thing. What it is, is a field of possibility. And that field of possibility is extremely real because without it, no atom could even exist. All atoms would collapse. All electrons would spiral into the nucleus of the, of the atoms in which they partake, and there wouldn't be no such thing as atoms. If that would happen to you right now, you would shrink down to be about the size of a, an amoeba sitting on the chair if all your atoms were to shrink in size like that. So... This is not something that happens where there's more, there's space. How, what is that space? That space is a field of probability, or field, sorry, field of possibility that represents where all the electronicness of your body resides. And it's in the electronicness, the electrons bubbling around inside of you, that the experience of life is really taking place. Those electrons are it's like an action show and giving off light and absorbing light and that all that dance is, is what we experience as, 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 as life. But when you observe, and you observe by looking at a single electron, many electrons, and you observe by looking at 
where they are or how they're moving, you have choices, you affect the patterns which take place. In your own nervous system right now, there are neurons. And uh, if you look at uh, what uh, these uh, neurons are doing, uh, they, they, have, uh, they, have an inner, they have an inner part and an outer part, an inner cellular and an exterior cellular part. And there are ions which pass back and forth from the inside to the outside. Sodium and potassium ions are the main ones. There are other ones too. <clears throat> and these passages of these ions in and out produce an electrical signal which travels around up the neuron into your brain or wherever it goes or down your arm into your leg giving you a, the sensation of your toe or your arm or whatever right now as I'm moving around. Well, these patterns are going on. These patterns are constantly changing because these ions are moving back and forwards. But they're passing through little gateways. We call them protein gates. And these gates don't stay open all the time. They're like little mouths. They open and close, open and close, open and close, open and close. And these things are very, they're molecules. They're pretty heavy molecules, but they're quantum. In other words, we don't exactly know whether they're open or whether they're closed. They're in the state of being both open and closed at the same time until observation takes place. And when that occurs, it changes the patterning. So as you, as an observer, start to observe the things around you, you are affecting these gate molecules of your neurons affecting what you think, how you smell, what you sense, how you intuit it, what you feel. All that is being controlled by the various movements of these gate molecules which are under your control. You're not controlling them individually, but you have patterns which you've set up which change according to what's happening. One of the big mysteries about the body, that's fantastic really, is that if you look at neural conduction, whether it's you're hearing a song, smelling a rose, or tasting a, an enchilada, whatever you're doing, if you watch the neurons that are moving and you watch the electrical signals that are firing, they are exactly the same. They don't look any different. More intense, you get less intense. The how often they just is the how, how, much, how hard you're pressing, uh, how bright the light is, etc. But the form looks identical. But somehow, in that difference of form, somehow in there, something is magical because what makes that form the smell of a rose or the color yellow? I mean, something, something made that occur. That's where the magic is. How does that happen? How does that happen? It's got to be in the quantum mechanics. It's got to be in the observer effect. And that's why in my seminars and even on this presentation that you will be seeing at home, getting in touch with the fact that there is an observer inside of you and that that's how transformation and change takes place in the same way that you can change from a color yellow to the taste of an enchilada. <laughs> There's a different observer acting. The observer that tastes an enchilada is not the same observer that sees the color yellow. How many observers are there in, in you? Pro approximately an infinite number. If you try to label each one, you know, there's the one that observes yellow. There's the one that observes yellow-orange. There's the one that hears the song. There's the one that hears a note of the song. There's one that tastes a strawberry. There's one that tastes a raspberry. They're not the same. You all feel that they're the same because we integrate these experiences and we put them all together. And that is the way we normally process the world. We all think it's... I'm just a human being feeling the world out and nothing magical about it. Everything's magical about it. It's like music. Vibration is something which la di da It vibrates as a tune. That vibration is within you, as it is without you as well. Now, the ancient Greeks came on the scene 
after the Egyptians, and they decided to do something about this vibration. They decided to call it something. They called it the fifth, that's number five, the fifth essence. The English word for that, I don't know what it is in Spanish, is quintessence. This vibration. But there